Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Energy MD podcast. So glad that you're here with me today. Because as you know, we look at all the causes of low energy and fatigue, and we're going to be talking about detoxification as well as the survival protein with my new friend, Isaac Elias. And let's learn a little bit about him. So Dr. Isaac Elias is a leading expert in the field of integrative medicine, specializing in cancer, detoxification, immunity, and complex conditions. He is a respected physician, researcher, best-selling author, educator, and mind-body practitioner. Dr. Elias par partners with leading research institutes, including Harvard, National Institute of Health, Columbia, and others to co-author studies on integrative therapies for cancer, heavy metal toxicity, and others. He is founder and medical director of Amitabha Medical Clinic in Santa Rosa, California, where he has pioneered the use of therapeutic apheresis as an adjunctive blood filtration treatment for detox and chronic degenerative conditions. And we're going to talk a little bit about its use in long COVID. So, Dr. Isaac, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and, and the opportunity to talk about such an important topic. So, we're going to be talking about the survival paradox, toxins, and the body's energy systems. So, you wrote the book, The Survival Paradox. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? Yes, so the survival paradox is really a culmination of... Uh, Multi, you know, 40, 40, 45 years of uh, studies, clinical experience, decades of meditation and research. And uh, it really introduces a new paradigm <clears throat> to, in understanding of health and disease. You can say it's a paradigm shift. We are all aware of inflammation as a driving force for so many illnesses, so many diseases, so many conditions. But inflammation is really not the cause. Inflammation is really a result. And what drives inflammation is the same thing that helps us survive. So because we are built, we are wired to survive innately all the way to the cellular level, we do it first by trying to develop as normal as possible embryonically and as we come to this world, and then by trying to repair any danger or any, any injury. And so because it's automated in us and it happens within fraction of a second within the autonomic nervous system within the sympathetic system by either fighting which equates to struggle to inflammation or flight running away hiding which which equates with isolation with creating a micro environment where we can hide which is the key factor in energy related diseases in almost every disease or by creating a shield which uh, which turns out into fibrosis and organ dysfunction. So while we have the sympathetic response that can be balanced if we take a deep breath, if we relax, if we breathe deep, if we meditate, if we do something that gives us a sense of safety, the biochemistry turns on through proteins called alarmins, survival proteins. And one of the key ones, galactin-3, is the one that I've been researching for almost 30 years. So while it turns on in order to help us survive, it ends up driving inflammation, fibrosis, and it changes the metabolic function of the cell. And as such, it will affect how the cell reacts with the environment, how the cell will react intracellularly, and the relationship between the Cytosome, the, the cytoplasm of the cell and the mitochondria as the factory for energy. And that's where we get to abnormal metabolic function and fatigue and burnout, etc. So it's all that's why the survival paradox is such a profound new aspect because you can address it from the point of view of biochemistry by blocking galactin 3. A lot of my research with modified citrus pectin with over 80 published papers. You can address it with lifestyle, with nutrition, with supplements, and you can understand it with a shift in our state of mind, state of heart, moving to a place of safety of open heart instead of a place of survival, of struggle, of a fight that uh, burns us out. So this is really an, a whole model for how to live our life 
but it has a very profound effect on on our healing capacity. So then can we use galactin three as a marker for for disease or inflammation or progress or response to treatment? Great question. Actually, I'm glad that you divided it into two parts. So, so galactin three is definitely a general marker not only diagnostic, but prognostic. So in general, in almost every category of disease, if you look at the population, if it's autoimmune disease, if it's cancers, if it's, if it's cardiovascular disease, uh, if it's neuroinflammation, the group with higher level of galactin-3 will have a more severe disease. And when you block galactin-3 with modified cytosprectin, you will, you will attenuate uh, you will you will attenuate the disease process, and this and interesting when you look at it, you have data on on cancers, you have data on autoimmunity, you have data on liver disease, heart disease, kidney disease, lung disease. Why? Because it's such a fundamental process. It doesn't mean that you decide who you give modified cytosine to based on the level of galactin-3 because of certain genetic factors and, and metalloproteinase activities. Certain people will have lower level of galactin-3 because of the structure, pentamer or monomer, but you still need to address it. However, for certain patients where you can see that as they get worse, the galactin-3 goes up for, and as they get better, the galactin-3 goes down. For this patient, it becomes a, an excellent biomarker. And the last comment on this point, because it's important, actually two comments, is the person has more experience than anyone in testing galactin-3. Uh, the standards for galactin-3 in the labs, and by the way, testing galactin-3 is approved by the FDA for almost for about 13 years. It's done by every lab, it's inexpensive, inexpensive to do. And but the standards are based on heart failure and patients with heart failure often have kidney problems and the galactin-3 goes up artificially. So it will say that normal is 17.8. Also this test was developed when it was manual. So now with automated testing, anybody above 12, 13 is already a concern and should move to a full dose of, of pectosol of 15 grams a day, 14 definitely. Uh, it's, you don't see very often people over 16, 17. In heart failure specifically, you do see. So this is a little bit about how, how to really understand the test. And when you block galactin-3, you don't necessarily remove it, but you block its detrimental effect. Because uh, what it does is uh, our survival paradox protein, when there is a problem, it goes to the area of the problem within minutes and it mobilizes different ligands, inflammatory ligands, hyperviscosity ligands, sticky molecule uh, uh, ligands, immune modulating ligands, and, it, and then they attach to each other and they create pentamer, and multiple pentamers create a coating, create actually a lattice formation. That will constitute the arteriosclerotic plaque, that will drive the biofilm, that will drive microenvironment for cancer, where cancer can grow, that can drive the place where Lyme disease can hide and chronic, you know, and different viruses and, uh, and, 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 and heavy metals and toxins, etc. So when you disrupt the structure, you allow the body to recalibrate. You allow the body to heal. To heal. And uh, it's interesting, when I started my journey with galactin-3 and modified cytosprectin 28, 29 years ago, and now I'm collaborating with the people who started this with Dr. Avram Raz from Wayne State. And nobody expected it to be such an active molecule for so many areas. But the focus was on cancer. But it's remarkable how much benefit it has blocking it because of its driving force being an upstream protein. So the last comment on it, because it's an upstream, if you look at it, a small change at the top, is gonna create a very big change over time. So if you look at galactin-3 between a normal person and, and a patient with serious condition, maybe it will double. You know, Maybe it will go up by 50%. But when you look at what it does to interleukin-6, 
it will take it up 1,000 fold, 5,000 fold, because it's very downstream. So when you block, I've published a number of landmark papers showing that in sepsis in animals, when we block galactin-3, we completely attenuate the, the interleukin-6 rise, we attenuate the kidney damage, and we attenuate the death in the, in the animals. And when a patient comes to the ICU with sepsis, with no pre-existing condition like kidney disease, heart disease, or cancer, their level of galactin-3 at time of admission will determine, determine if they're going to die later on from the sepsis mm. in the ICU. Same with COVID. Patient who come to the emergency room with COVID in the initial very aggressive stage in 2020, very big study from Mexico City, regardless of the involvement of the lungs, the level of galactin-3 in the emergency room will determine will determine who will make it to the ICU and who will actually die. Mm. Because it's a very early, not only marker, there is a process that is already starting. And by the time we recognize it, because we haven't addressed the root cause, which is blocking galactin-3, or changing the survival response, it's kind of too late. It's like catching a waterfall at the bottom with a bucket. It's not going to work. So it seems like it's... Um... It's a really great marker to use, but it's not necessarily being used in this way so far, at least in, in I learned about it as a, as a heart disease marker, as a heart failure right. marker. Right. Um, and that was in the integrative medicine um, community. So why do you think that collectin three is not being used more um, conventionally? You know, the, there's a famous saying that actually Keith Block showed it's on his wall for many years ago. Uh, they said, first they ridicule you, then they fight you, and then they say it's self-evident. So now it's self-evident. I have a very large multi-million dollar grant from the NIH to study removal of galactin-3 via pheresis in sepsis, my second grant, you know. I'm working with leading head of departments in the most prestigious medical centers in the world. It took only 30 years, you know, but it's there. It's part of it is you have to understand it. It has a complex role and there's huge interest in it. In fact, there is a review article on, on Galactin-3, Galactin-1 also, there are different Galactin, but Galactin-3 is the center one, main one in cancer in, in Nature Review. It's like 112 impact factor, okay? I mean, didn't know that things exist. You know, huge review talking how much it's how important it is. And the first example of a blocker actually is is my modified citrus pectin with my studies. So it's kind of nice. So as you can see, I mean, it was in JNCI, in Journal of National Cancer Institute, in 1995. But you know, we know it. There is a bias against natural products, and there is no big money to be made. I just presented a poster session at ASCO. You know, the main cancer organization, GU in San Francisco last week, on an 18 month follow up on biochemical relapse of prostate cancer. So, prostate cancer was removed. There is no PSA, no prostate, no cancer. Now, PSA starts coming up. It's an indication of cancer. And the rise, the pace of rise is very accurate determination of cancer progression. After 18 months, multi center for 60 patients, then whoever benefited after six months moved on, most of them did, about 80%. 90% of the patients had a slower progression, most of them stopping or, or, or even going down compared to baseline 18 months ago. I had a poster session. If this was a drug, I would have been in the plenary session, you know, and right, and it would have been in, 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 in New England Journal of Medicine. So I'm used to it. It even doesn't frustrate me. It's part of my reality. It's the one part of the other part that I'm free and I'm not bound, you know, by, by more restrictions and being very much just, you know, science, you know, very much just, you know, random clinical trial based, but it's part of the bias. Now we have such amazing data that we are going to publish in the next year or two about community results. That at some point, the dam is going to break, you know, and oncologists mm -hmm. will start recommending modified citrus pectin among a naturopath, for example, it's the most recommended supplement in, in nutritional oncological support by far. And it's not because of marketing, it's because of science and because of the efficacy. So it just takes time, you know, it just 
you take a deep breath and you keep doing your work. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about modified citrus pectin. Um, tell us about how it's constructed and the things that it does in the body. So citrus pectin is a long chain of carbohydrates of carbohydrate sugars, again, not sugar glucose. It's a very long chain, a very high molecular weight, 100 to 300 kilo Dalton. It has some branches and it's highly esterified. It doesn't get absorbed into the bloodstream from the gut. It's a good fiber. It can lower cholesterol, can bind some toxins in the gut. When you modify very specifically to a low molecular weight into a specific structure using specific enzymes, it gets absorbed into the bloodstream and there it has its galactin-3 blocking effect. In addition, modified citrus pectin, specifically pectosol, is very rich in, in, a, in, a, in a compound called rhamnogalacturonan 2, which is an immune enhancing carbohydrate that is also present in mistletoe. That's the active one. Mm. And it also has a very unique ability to bind to heavy metals. So it becomes a systemic, a systemic binder of heavy metals in addition to its other benefits. But what it does, it goes and it blocks what we call the carbohydrate recognition domain, this, this arm in the, in the galactin-3 that binds to the different nasty ligands and autoreceptors, and it stops the damaging effect. So when you look at the results, for example, in, a, in prostate cancer of modified citrus pectin, it is not because modified citrus pectin kills cancer. And it is not because it modifies the hormonal receptors, which often, which is the main mechanism of the basic drugs and also of some natural products. Because once you change the hormonal expression of tumor, the clock starts ticking. The cancer will figure out. It literally allows the body to fight the cancer better by changing the metabolic environment, by changing the microenvironment, by allowing oxygen to get into the, into, into the tissue, by attenuating, taking down the activity of the, of the inflammatory macrophage, by regulating the cytokine excretion, and by regulating insulin receptors. So AMPK works better, mTOR1 gets blocked, mitochondria functions better, and by upregulating P53 as a result, so the cell can fight against cancer. And so as a result, you, one, one side effect in these patients is that their memory gets better, their joint pains gets better, their energy gets better, because the body is allowed to heal. And that's, so, that's what's so fascinating about it. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And so this is all happening because the modified citrus pectin is acting on the galactin-3 or all those different mechanisms that you were, that you were discussing. Is it acting on those in those different pathways or is there a central place that it's acting where it's either binding up the um, the metals or it's blocking the galactin-3 or is it just doing all these different things? So the binding of metals is a secondary benefit. And it's interesting how I got the, the idea is that there were reports from Chernobyl in the very late 80s, early 90s, and children were giving sodium pectate and their radiation levels were, were because they were consuming it with food. So you got you, you really had to buy you, you had to bind it in the gut. Mm. And there was like a 60% reduction in radiation readings. You know, the whole pectin industry thought, my God, here is a great market. And of course, nobody had the money to, to pay for the product. And when I heard this, that's when I knew, wow. That's when it clicked for me that it's a heavy metal chelator. And then if, since I modified it, it's going to be systemically. I remember I got the results of the study. I was just lecturing at Aiken, which was at that time the prime organization, you know, 23 years ago. And I just showed, you know, you, you, it wasn't the PowerPoint. I just put the slide on the screen and it showed the, the, the data. So that, that's another benefit. The key benefit is the blocking of galactin-3 because galactin-3 drives the cytokine storm. It drives it. And galactin-3 drives interleukin-6, interleukin-1b, interleukin-4, TNF-alpha, NF-kappa-beta. A TGF beta fibrotic pathways, they're all starting with galactin 3. And that's why when we are blocking it, 
and we get so many downstream benefits because it's really something that was going to help us and it never turned off. You see, if we could turn it on for five minutes and turn it off, it would be very important. It would still turn for five minutes because wherever it's needed, it will be expressed, but it doesn't get blocked. And that's where the problem starts. And so it's very exciting. I'm, uh, we, have, we have data from very small animals not only on the blocking of MC, on using MCP and attenuating sepsis, you know, 11 million people die from sepsis, but also when we remove a galactin-3 in rats, they don't die from sepsis. But now we're about to do the large animal studies, and if we show it, then we'll move into clinical trials. But it's going to be a very elegant solution. Uh, if it works, I think it will work. I just have to get it to this stage to having the ICU uh, and a pharesis device that can actually remove galactin-3 and basically take out the fire from the process without depleting the patient, without doing, it's very elegant. We're just removing this, this molecule that is in tiny amounts. And modified it was and the supplement does something very similar. Uh, of course, in sepsis, you need something very bombastic that just depletes galactin-3 in two hours. Yeah. because otherwise the person will be dead. Uh, but uh, that's, that's part of the role of what it does. Mm -hmm. And so then it sounds like you want the level to be less than 12 of the galactin-3. And so do you titrate up on the modified citrus pectin until you get there? No. Basically, the dosage for modified citrus pectin, if you are very healthy, no, no risk factor, then maybe you're under 40 years old and your galactin-3 is under 10, you can take five grams a day. And I can say comfortably, not because I developed it. <clears throat> and, you know, in 20 years ago, it wasn't the first supplement I recommended. Modified hydrospectin is the most important supplement someone can take because it directly affects our longevity. And, but... If you have any inflammation-driven issues, if you want to detoxify, if you have any risks, if you, and if you are healthy, but your galactin-3 is over 11, 12, you should take 10 grams a day. If you have health concerns, you have to take 15 grams a day. If your galactin-3 is over 17, 18, you should take 20 grams a day. The only exception is somebody who has advanced kidney failure. Advanced kidney failure is EGFR under 25, 30. Then you'll start with 10. If you're over 30, you can do 15 grams. And the reason is the, the pectin is buffered with potassium and the kidney has a little bit of a limited amount of capacity to, to, to excrete potassium. So you have to be a little bit more careful. In the same time, there is very solid data that blocking galactin-3 with modified hydrospectin improve chronic kidney disease, which is my next topic once I get done with sepsis is uh, I'm a strong believer based on clinical results that chronic kidney disease is a treatable condition, that kidney function can be improved. You know, in, in, uh, in medicine, we always look at slowing down the deterioration, but as long as the body is alive, as long as the body is changing, the body has a choice which way it wants to go. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so it sounds like you prefer the galactin-3 to be under 10. Ideally, but it depends on the, the very curious cases are when somebody is, like, is healthy and they come with a galactin-3 of 20. Mm. So either sometimes they have a lot of heavy metals in the, in the bone marrow, like a lot of lead and some kind of dysfunction in the bone marrow and inflammation in the which is stimulating galactin-3. They have a scar, either from surgery that didn't heal well, or they have an internal scar, or they have a big emotional traumatic scar, mm. and uh, or they have some kind of disease they're not aware of. And uh, yes, and then and then then you need to give them a, a high dose. And it's interesting using more than 15 grams because I came up with the 15 grams that now the world is using, and but some very smart patients uh, figured out they were not getting response 
at 15 and th at that time nobody could measure galactin 3 and they just decided to take 20, 25 and it worked. So it's simply that if you have more galactin 3, you have more that you need to block. That's really why, why, why you need more. And as you get better, you can lower it down. And it's important to remember that galactin 3 is our survival protein, but we are not the only ones who want to survive. Our microbiome wants to live in harmony with us. Mm. So when we disrupt our biofilm, it utilizes galactin-3 to invade the lining of the gut. The spike protein of the COVID, of the coronavirus, is practically identical to galactin-3. Mm. It's the same survival protein of the virus. And the place where there is the highest amount of density of galactin-3 receptors in the body is in the lungs. Because the lungs is constant, ex from all the internal organs, the lungs are the ones that are exposed to the world, right? Through air. There's no other, there's the first organ to be exposed. We take a deep breath, boom, it's in our lungs. We have to deal with it. So it's not surprising that, that we get this effect. But once, for example, in COVID, a patient gets to be, to have kidney damage, AKI, then mortality skyrocketed and it's driven by galactin-3. So then is the spike protein triggering the galactin-3 to increase or is it the spike protein that then is causing similar um, type of inflammation as right. the galactin-3? It's causing similar inflammation. There is data that blocking galactin-3 helps attenuate COVID. Data was already in, 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 in mid-2020. <laughs> But I couldn't get a clinical trial because it was so pharma-based, you know, no hospital would, would, would talk to me. But once it creates, it triggers an, an inflammatory response, and once it gets to the kidneys, then the galactin-3 excreted in the kidneys start putting the whole body in, into crisis. And that's why it's so important to avoid AKI, acute kidney injury, which is more common than you know, mm -hmm. you know, millions of, of cases a year. Uh, a crazy percentage of patients who get hospitalized. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, uh, you know, not only with, with COVID, with every infection, you have to address the infectious agent, but it's usually the body's response that kills us, you know. Right. Right, as we know so well with, with COVID and with long-haul COVID and et cetera, so. Yeah, you know, right now in, in society and in the world, we have this question of why are some people getting long COVID and other people are not? And what I'm seeing is that a lot of it has to do with the inflammation that's already built up in the people from things like heavy metals, chemicals, molds, or other infections. I wonder if we can be using galactin-3 as a marker for those who would potentially get long COVID. Because when you were talking about how some of these people who appear to be healthy, because a lot of these people who are getting long COVID are healthy, and they just go back to training for their marathon too soon, that they probably have a galactin-3 of 20. And these would be some of those people that we could check and we could and we could coach them differently on, hey, you need to be extra careful if you get COVID. Uh, or, you know, because a lot of these people also would potentially progress to ME-CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, right? Because they've got a number of these things. They've got, they already have the inflammation that's present and they just need something that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. Does that make sense to you? I can't tell you how accurate you are. And the most important sentence you said, something, somebody who goes to marathon too soon. Mm -hmm. And that's a classical one. So all of this is true. People have high toxic burden. I mean, you can see people who have like mold exposure, getting neurological diseases of the twenties, like myasthenia gravis in the seventies. I mean, it's insane, unheard of. But when we utilize our immune system too soon, we don't rest enough. Yeah, we may be okay, but we are not able to repair properly and the immune system will respond. That's what happened to me on a personal level. I happened to be in Israel after two and a half years of not being there and I was about to teach a meditation healing retreat to 150 people that were in the hallway. In 45 minutes before the retreat, I do a COVID test and I'm positive. Mm. What, and I really was sick. If I was at home, I would have my supplement, my IV, I would take a complete rest for two weeks. But here I am and I felt bad about it. So I rested, but on day number three, I was negative within 48 hours. I started teaching. 
far away from people. Then, so I taught for seven days, 150 people. It was amazing. My mind was trained enough to hold it. But when I came back to the United States, my whole immune system and the fact that I had Lyme disease when I was younger, it all exploded on me, you know? And then I recovered by letting go. And then again, I worked, I went back and I did my marathon of work too early. And then I almost left this world. And now, now I'm fine. And now I know I need to pace myself. And so that's what happens. So very often, past infections are really key, key, key. You know, pe people who really had, had past infections, that's, they will get triggered. It's a, it's a real issue. So Lyme disease, any spirochete, you know, weird viral illnesses, you know, of course, uh, all the, you know, Epstein bar everything gets re-triggered. And the real way to understand it and to, and to address it is not to treat the disease, to treat the person. If you treat the person properly, the person will get better. Mm -hmm. And it's very universal for, for any chronic condition because we, as human beings, have the capacity to heal. We need to connect with it. When it's an acute condition, it's a very different story. Then you really hit the pathogen as hard as you can, including in Lyme disease. But once it becomes a, a chronic condition, then every time we take aggressive measures, both the infectious agent and both the body's response system will respond in a way that will ha will give us a a higher price, you know, later on. And but 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 toxins are really are key to what they do in the future. You know, there's a famous saying in Hebrew, "Avotachlu boser veshinei banim tikena." Our ancestor ate unripe fruit, and we our teeth color will change. And that's an example, you know, and so that's, uh, that's the power when we take care of our health, we have the ability to heal ourselves and to heal people around us, you know. And so all of these uh, pandemics, epidemics are giving us a, a real challenge, you know, a real run for our money. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned treating the person and not necessarily treating the disease or treating the infection when we're talking about something chronic. Can you elaborate more on that? It sounds like you're talking about mind, body, spirit, in addition to the physical, but can you clarify? Yeah, and I would, I would uh, qualify that the most dramatic beneficial category of diseases is fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. It's incredible. So in my background, and I've started my meditation training when I was 15, I'm 63 now. And for 20 years, I would go to the mountains for two months a year to meditate. And for 10 years, I did a half day retreat, half day uh, work. And I, I was fortunate to treat and study one-on-one -on -one with the greatest meditation masters in the Himalayas. So I come with decades of training. So a little bit of gravita to my experience. Mm -hmm. And so the mind has, an, has a power to shift our ability to heal. And from the pers perspective of the survival paradox, it shifts us from a survival reactive response to an open heart, love and compassion responsiveness. Mm. Now this, we can talk about it from the point of view of what happened in, in the process of detox, of healing, we can talk about it from this term that may sound a little esoteric, but I always I always give the examples all the way to cellular function, all the way to pathways. And every cell in our body is built to survive. And as such, every cell in our body wants to take in nourishment and throws out what it doesn't want. And every cell is an identified entity with a boundary, a membrane, and you decide what comes in, what comes out. So we're different receptors, different doors. And so we have this uh, cell that are kind of selfish. They want to really get what they want, but they recognize that they are part of a community of 50 trillion cells rounding up a little bit. And each cell, I didn't know it until a few years when I checked it ago, each cell has, you know how many reactions a cell has every second? One million reactions, can you believe? Wow. So even, can you imagine having like 50 trillion times one million a second? 
isn't it a miracle that we can talk? Forget about talking two languages, you know, that's completely <laughs> mind-blowing, mind right? So we have this, what we call again in Judaism, it's called Arvut Adadit, you know, we, we support each other, right? But it's a good deal. Uh, no, his only the Dalai Lama says, to be selfless is a very good thing from a selfish point of view. You know, it helps us, it helps our health. So, but every, every organ takes care of itself and throws away what it wants. And if something attacks the cell, it puts a fight. It changes the receptor, it changes the environment. The only organ that behaves differently is the heart. The heart is the only organ that not only accepts, but thrives on taking all the dirty blood from everybody. Everything that the other organ didn't want that comes to the heart, the heart takes it with an open heart. Otherwise the heart is not functioning. It connects with the universe, with the breath. And then you have the change of energy of oxygenation in the lungs which serves the heart. And then the hearts give blood without discrimination, right? The artery is a stiff artery. But once the heart, the heart gives blood, it relaxes. And who does it nourish? The closer to the heart, it nourishes itself through the coronary arteries. So, you know, it's part of nourishing itself in order to nourish others and as part of nourishing others. So when we make the shift, there is a cellular shift. Suddenly the cell relaxes and then suddenly pains go away. So if we look at it from a spiritual point of view and we take the esoteric into our body, the heart just wants to give. Or the heart, you know, in almost every tradition, the connection with the divine happens in the heart. You know, in Buddhism, the tikkun in Judaism, in every place, you know, it doesn't matter which, which tradition. And then the heart just connects with the universe and gives. But, and it gives through the blood. So the quality of the blood is very, very important. How pure it is, how clean it is, how good is the information that comes. But the cells have to be willing to receive to open their arms, to open their hearts. So when the cell is in a survival mode, as you know so well, it goes into a survival mode, it changes the pH, it changes the receptors, the macrophage become inflammatory, the cytokines are not working well, and the cell is not functioning well, causing mitochondrial dysfunction and chronic fatigue, diabetes, autoimmunity, or even if there is oxygen, they won't function normally because they're in a fighting mode. That's the Warburg effect in cancer. So in chronic fatigue, in every disease, if we can, we can let the cells open up and connect with our heart, healing will happen right away. And that's part of what I teach. I teach in the last decade, mainly in Israel, but I'm going to have to start teaching in other places. It's, I call it open heart medicine, the infinite healing power of love and compassion. And when, so there's a way I teach it, that when people do this together with diet and with exercise, it's profound what can happen in a few days. You know, cancer markers will get better, but chronic fatigue is the one condition where people start suddenly feel, wow, I got my energy back. And so it's a great, it's it definitely, so that's the mind part, but of course it has to be helped with supplement, with nutrition, with lifestyle. And sometimes when you need more heroic measures like therapeutic apheresis, then you, you you use more heroic measures. That's each person needs a, a different a different support level. So the open heart medicine you were just describing is that um, mainly a meditation practice. You talked about a, a number of other things along with it, but it sounded like heart centered meditation. Yeah, yeah, but it's very. It's very sophisticated and it's very in simple in the same time. It's a certain, it's a certain development of a very common heart-centered meditation called Tonglen, exchanging suffering with love and compassion, which is done with the outside world. So I had this insight that I kept for myself for many, many years when I was in the mountains for many months uh, about how to do it inside the body, all the way to the cellular level. So now I teach it. And ideally, I teach it in a retreat environment because the peeling of traumas of what we hold in ours is so profound. But uh, it's time for me to kind of, I'm getting old, so I'm ready to just share it more widely. I actually wrote a book about it in Hebrew that was supposed to come out just after as the COVID started. So 
I put it on hold. I will write it in English. It's my second book. It's supposed to be my, my first one, but it's very, it's very, very, it's, it, it's, it's really, it's something all of us can do every moment. The issue, even when we meditate, we meditate outside and we often skip the body. And the idea is that to realize that our inner space between our inner heart and our skin is infinite because every cell in our body has our DNA, which is made out of infinite number of people. You think about it, 25 years for a generation. You go back 2000 years, it's an infinite number. You know, two, two to the 80 is an infinite number. And uh, without doubt, and so you have the genetics, and you have epigenetics. And there's one of the one of the most sentences of wisdom, ancient sentences in Hebrew says, Hakol Safui Vehareshut Netuna. Everything is predetermined. That's genetics. Vehareshut Netuna, we have the choice. That's epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And it's so amazing how they knew this thousands of years ago. So we in our work, in your work, in my work, we are focused on the Reshut Netuna, on the, our ability to change our health. And in many levels, the more solid, materialistic, easy to feel, touch, see methods are easier to do, are easy, work very easily, how to, to keep, for example, keeping a good diet. I mean, if we all kept a good diet, we would all feel much better, you know? And an example, and the more you go to the subtle level, it gets a little bit more complicated to connect. But once you make the change there, you're making the change at the source, and then it just washes into all the layers. So the idea is to try to integrate. So in my personal journey, I was fortunate, you know, to, to start research on this protein that nobody thought is so big about survival paradox and find the compound that does it to use therapeutic aphoresis where I filter the blood outside the body, right, bigger than the body. And at the same time to get this esoteric meditation training, you know, I'm also an acupuncturist. So it, it was my, my crazy journey. We all, each of us has their own crazy journey, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it's very tricky, especially with energy issues. Uh, because often issues like fatigue are, and pain are jeopardizing our life because there is a certain pattern that has been established. I'm sure you know this so well. And there is almost an expectation when one symptom starts and we had, and usually symptom number one is followed by symptom number two and three, we make an assumption that if symptom one appeared, now symptom two and symptom three are going to appear. And there's a good reason to it. There are the habits and there are the neurological pathways that have been established. So in order to heal, we need to wipe out the neurological pathways. So meditation, when very sophisticated, that's really open heart medicine, when we release from the cell, does it. And other healing methods do it. You know, there's a lot of interest now in psychedelics for a very similar reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, if you can do it with meditation, then you don't need to use other substances, but it takes a lot of training. But that's the downside. The upside is that you can do it whenever you want. You know, it's not, you don't, have, you know, there are no risks. And, uh, but really it's very important for us, for anyone who has chronic fatigue, as somebody who had severe rickets cell disease in 88 and never bothered, once I got healed, I never bothered to check even if I also had Lyme. Uh, and it took me years to heal, and but it didn't affect my life. It's really this anticipation that if I feel step number one, step number two is going to happen, and then we restrict our life, we restrict what we do, and then we fall into this pitfall. And the other part that is really important, again, a little bit deviating, people who have issue with energy and uh, pain, is that our repair our recuperation is longer for this patient. It takes longer to recuperate. So you have to time yourself. One of the biggest mistakes of people with, with, with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, is that they overexert energy when they feel good and they're not able to replenish 
the reservoirs fast enough because mitochondria is not working well and because their clearing detox methods are not coming in. And that's really what you mentioned when you said that long haul is affected by infections and toxins and mold. All of this disrupt our ability to detoxify. I know I'm kind of loading a lot and you just have to kind of listen, but the toxins is big, you know. I I overlooked, I overlooked, I knew it, but I didn't, I kind of accepted that, for example, we can all be bombarded with glyphosate and it's kind of the reality, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, everybody in the United States is poisoned by a pesticide at one level or another, everyone. Literally 100% you'll find something in the urine. We just got trained that it's acceptable to have a little bit of toxic, of toxic material. And now that I'm doing research on how to remove it, I can see the effect on neuroinflammation and, you know, and cognitive function. Uh, again, very, very works very well when you block uh, galactin three with modified citrus pectin, and you, you, I have a certain formulation that for this. And we're in the middle of our trials. You know, the first cases were amazing, but we want to have like 20, 30 cases, and we'll have a big paper. Uh, one of the principles, at least for me, I don't talk about a problem unless I can offer a solution, <laughs> because what's the point, right? To just get people more anxious. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's an amazing journey to kind of integrate these different things. Well, I so appreciate you taking the time to share it with us today. Such a wealth of knowledge. I have two questions for you and then we will conclude. So the first one is <clears throat> when to take modified citrus pectin, because I've heard that you can take it with food and with other supplements, but as a binder, I would imagine that it might bind those things up. And so we may want to take it on an empty stomach. So I'm curious about your opinion on that. Right, but remember it also gets absorbed. So actually I'm the guy who got, who started this whole thing about doing it very far away from food, 15 minutes before food and a few minutes before supplements, it's fine. It's not a problem. It, it doesn't have any effect on, on, uh, on, on other things. It's nice, don't do it with food, but it's more important to do it than to skip it because you're not the right time. And you can do it only twice a day. There's no need to do it three times a day. The half-life, at least based on some studies we've done, is about 10, 12 hours, so it's pretty long. Uh, so, tw so, 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 so twice a day is fine. And with the end, so if you're doing it twice a day, the dosing that you were recommending before, five grams, 10 grams, 15 grams, is that total for the day or is that per dose? Total, total for the day. So 15 will be like one and a half scoops of pectosol twice a day. And then uh, if you need 10, it's only one scoop or six capsules. I, I like I take capsules. And, uh, and then if you need more, you, yeah, you just divide the total amount by two, definitely. Excellent. Well, I still appreciate the clinical pearls. I'm definitely going to start using Galactin-3 and more modified citrus pectin. I kind of moved away from it in lieu of, of other binders and other things that I was using to remove toxins, but I just love this, able, this ability to track the Galactin-3 and kind of as an inflammatory marker to kind of monitor some of the um, fri uh, fibrinolytic, not fibrinolytic, but the fibrin producing changes and some of the other um, consequences of inflammation. So thank you so much for that. And, uh, and you can ahead. use it with other binders. It's not a problem, but it, it's more than a binder. That's it's, yeah, the common, it's really, it is also a binder, but it's much more than a binder. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the best way for people to get access to you. We have a website here, drilaz.org. Yeah, that's a good place, drilaz.org. I have a I have a research team that puts out a, a high quality newsletter once a week and they can find more information about my work, my formulations, my, my lectures. And I do hope at the second half of the year to offer a, a free on Zoom retreat for a few days so people can experience the power of open heart medicine and what it can do for them. Definitely let me know about that because I'd like to share that with my audience and probably attend myself as well. Um, and then you also have a free chapter one and two of your book, Survival Paradox. So we'll go ahead and we'll put that link um, with this episode as well. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure learning from you and getting to know you better. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 
I hope you learned something on today's podcast. If you did, please share it with your friends and family and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It's really helpful for getting this information out to more people who desperately need it. Sharing all the experts I know and love and the powerful tips I have is one of my absolute favorite things to do. Thanks for being part of my community. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. It is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. Thanks for listening and have an amazing day.